What's happening? I'm back again at the Turtle Survival Center here in South Carolina, and we are about to go into the nursery, if you will. Now, this is an exciting part for me because this is actually the fruits of everyone's hard labor. Remember, they're trying to keep these animals alive into the 21st century and beyond, and the room right behind me is testament to all that hard work because we're about to meet some of the rarest little babies you'll ever see. Come join me after the intro. portion of my life has been all about action, which still holds true. But now I pour all that time and energy into wildlife conservation, education, and the pursuit of knowledge. This is Camp Tenor. Okay, so as promised, I brought you inside the Turtle Survival Center's hatchling room. We're here with Nate Hayslick, who is the facilities manager. He's kind of a, you're a little bit of everything. You're a horticulturist, you know about turtles, you're a zookeeper, and you also build a lot of the facility that we've been seeing. And you had something to do with this room in general, haven't you? Right, so uh, we made this specifically for a lot of our aquatic species. We wanted to make sure that all of our baby turtles were getting clean, oxygenated, filtered water all the time, basically giving them the best care we could possibly give them. So all these are different species of um, box turtles, spiny forest turtle, a variety of different species, and all of them are getting clean, recirculated, filtered water. I mean, how long did it take you to set up this room? And obviously, you guys are going to add to this, aren't you? Yeah, so this is phase one of construction. Um, it took us probably about a month or so to really flesh out a lot of the plumbing and the, the UV lighting and stuff like that and it'll continue to grow as our collection grows. And you're you're definitely one of the guys and Chris Hagen is here as well. He's the director of animal management. Didn't want to leave you out there buddy but you guys may remember him from the last episode. As a collector, as, as somebody who works with a large collection himself, mostly tortoises, I don't really worry too much about water. Um, you know for you and the rest of the people who are day to day keeping these animals clean, how, how labor intensive is cleaning this, this uh, enclosure, these enclosures? So what we wanted to focus on is make it as little labor as possible. We wanted to focus to where it was easy for the keepers to maintain the turtles as clean as possible, but yet not eating up a lot of our time. So all the filtration is pretty much automatic. It cleans itself, it flushes itself. And you so have sump, a sump filter here. Can you show right. me that actually? That's pretty interesting. This is like a do-it-yourself thing. This is not something so, you have to spend thousands and thousands of dollars on, is it? Yeah, so as, as the water goes down, it drains from all of these different tubs. It want, meets one central drainage pipe and it goes into this sump. And then it's actually filtered through a, a couple different media. We've got sphagnum moss in there to help with acidity, kind of bring the pH down. A lot of the turtles like a little bit of a lower pH in our water. This is also a filtration system that um, it's called BioBalls. There's a lot of different oxygenation things going on in there. So as the water trickles over, it gets oxygenated but also filtered. And bacteria, beneficial bacteria, are also breaking right. down some of the nitrates and ammonia and things of that. And nature. then it goes through these these pipes again wow. and returns back clean to the turtles. All right, very cool, man. And so. Chris, now this is a question for you. Um, when you're handling a collection with different species, mm -hmm. so many times you, you worry about cross-contamination. Right. These are all captive bred babies, correct? Correct, yeah. So the, the opportunity for them to have a pathogen is greatly diminished, It's correct? lower, it's much lower, although we still test some of these, test these animals. We do disease wow. testing here, disease screening, so to speak, where we take swabs from their mouth and their cloaca and send that into a university to do PCR testing to see if they're actually carrying any uh, nasty pathogens. So you see how much work goes into this? This is an incredible facility. I mean, you know, guys, I often say that if you're a private keeper, you really want to strive for this level of, of cleanliness and, and functionality because it's going to make your life so much easier because, guys, I mean, you know this, how, how catastrophic would some kind of pathogen yeah. running through a collection be? Yeah. Exactly. You know, I, I mean, it would cost so much, it costs less money to prevent disease than it does trying to cure disease. And in most cases, it's not always able to uh, kind of wipe it out. But you know, Chris, I want to ask you, uh, I'm seeing some cool animals. Let's yeah. pull some out and show the folks what species we're dealing with you in here. Pull that one out, you can see them right uh, there. May I? Yeah. All right. Hey, little buddy. Oh my gosh. This is going to be my first time, man. That's a McCord box turtle. This is one of those holy grail of turtles that I rarely get to see, named after Bill McCord, yeah. who for many, many years 
uh, just had his hands in describing so many different animals as you were telling me and any real turtle nerd like myself would know. But look at how beautiful this animal is. Mm -hmm. You know, so you guys are producing this one, a very rare species. Uh, Correct. Oh, These particular turtles were actually hatched at Zoo Atlanta oh, okay. and their loan returns because we have animals out on breeding loan to many zoos and private individuals such as yourself and so uh, often half of those hatchlings are returned right. to us uh, per the breeding loan agreement. And so then they raise them up yeah. and you know the goal is as we've stated in previous episodes is to repatriate these animals and once the geopolitical things, uh, the governments and perhaps as, as we've mentioned in the past culture changes to realize that eating this guy's organs is not going to save you or make you live longer. Mm -hmm. In fact, a smarter thing to do would be to eat what the turtle eats. So start eating grass and bugs. You may live longer. <laughs> <laughs> Leave these little guys alone. I'm going to put him back and I want to pull out a turtle that has been one of my favorites. So I do feel a little bit like a kid in a candy store here. You guys are really letting me go hog wild in the hatchling room. But this is Geosemi spinosa, the cogwheel turtle, the spiny turtle, the ninja star turtle, whatever you want to call it. It's the spinosa. And um, how about this? Pretty cool from the top, right? It's got all these kind of protrusions, these spines. And you know, no one knows for certain. It's, it's a little bit of camouflage, but it could also be when they're young like this, uh, if something were to get this whole turtle in its mouth, it would not feel too good. So it's, it's definitely some kind of protection. But as they get older, these wear down. Um, but then, when you do this, how beautiful is that plastron? And that's this kind of what reminds me of the genus name, Heosemis. I've worked with the uh, giant Asian palm turtles, which are in the same genus, he Heosemis. Um, and they have a very similar, not quite as beautiful, but they do have a similar uh, plastron, which gives them the name giant wood turtle, giant palm turtle. But uh, this is just an exceptional animal. So, I mean, guys, what, what does it take to keep one of these healthy and going? And, and you know, how old is this one? This one's one year, just over a year old, wow. about uh, 14 months maybe. Um, and it was hatched here. It was the first one we hatched here in this facility. Uh, then when they're young, they're fairly aquatic. And as they grow older, they turn into more of a, a terrestrial swamp kind of habitat turtle. Um, where they, they're higher domed, they're not as flat, and as Kenan mentioned, they, those spikes smooth out, and yeah. so they're, um, they get about uh, nine or ten inches when they're fully grown. And these guys don't necessarily like, they're from kind of cooler tropical forests, is, is that correct? They're from lowland. Okay. Uh, they, they, so a little warmer. It, it, they have microclimates where it's a little bit cooler. Okay. But so flowing, they're, they're, flowing water. They're from the tropic, gotcha. tropical, tropical areas, and they do like to soak in streams and in like peat swamp forest oh, types. Cool. Yeah. So this is so cool. I'm getting an education myself. That's the whole purpose of coming out here and talking to you guys because it's impossible for one person to know everything about every reptile. And that's why you need to come to the specialists and really get yourself a good education. So don't be afraid of asking questions and don't be afraid of being wrong. Uh, it actually helps you out in the long run as long as you're not, you know, too snooty to take advice. <laughs> okay? You hearing me? Let's put this little guy back and continue on the tour. Uh, enough bloviating for one day. Look that word up too, kids. Okay, oh, this one's a little fast too. So we spoke about this animal after, um, this is the Vietnamese palm turtle, this is the Anamensis, a uh, little outgoing guy here. And Nate was making a joke. Nate, you like them when they're this size, you think they look great. Yeah. This is the, when they're the prettiest, you think? Exactly, yeah, they're very colorful. They're very, that, that yellow is very bright on their face. Um, and as you guys probably saw, once they get up older, they lose a lot of that coloration, become very drab, and just kind of an overall blackish brown. This is now uh, one of the rarest animals on Earth because they are no longer uh, found in their native range in the wild. So that's why it's so important to keep these animals alive, at least in a captive situation at like the Turtle Survival Center here in South Carolina, uh, to keep this species uh, going. And that's that's essentially why you guys are here, isn't it? Yeah. Simply. Yeah. Um, you know, the last thing I want to talk about, though, is the incubation. Now, to get one of these little guys, it just so happens you have an Anamensis egg Pippin. You want to grab yeah. it? Come on over here, guys. Check this out. So. As with anything that the TSA is doing, they're doing it in a big way, in a cool way. Um, so show me what you got here, Chris. So we have some uh, uh, Vietnamese pond turtle eggs here. And you can see this one starting to crack open yes. right here on that. the edge. That means it's pipping. 
the turtle has a little egg tooth on the end of its uh, end of its face there that, that falls off after a couple of weeks, and it, it uses it to tear open the egg. And you can see this here, um, how it's, it's starting to open up, and within probably tonight or tomorrow morning, he's going to come all the way out of this egg, and he can move into uh, an area to where he has to absorb his, if he hasn't absorbed his yolk sac completely yet, he'll absorb that. And then, once he unfolds from his egg shape and into this more flatter, um, actually, turtle shape, turtle <laughs> shape, then he can go into the system here. Yeah, very cool, man. Yep. And then, about how long uh, do, they, do you keep them in a kind of uh, yolk absorbing uh, situation. It takes about a week or okay. so. Yeah. yeah. And in fact, Depending. you know, guys, in the wild, some of these animals may stay in their nest for a couple of weeks while they, you know, being born, whether you're a mammal or you're coming out of an egg, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of stress on the organism. Mm -hmm. So basically, he's going to get out, chill out for a while, yeah. use that yolk to feed himself, and then try and avoid becoming dinner yeah. for any predators. And by predators, I also mean human beings. But uh, he doesn't have to worry about that here. Yeah. Uh, very cool donation you guys got also yeah. from St. Augustine Alligator Farm. Is this incredible incubator. And I know you guys can't wait till you fill it yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's, it's so fun being a turtle guy or a reptile guy. When you get eggs and you get this to turn into that, it's one of the most rewarding things. But, you know, testament and, and even more important than just being a hobbyist, uh, what these gentlemen here and what the TSA as an organization is doing across the globe is so important for this species and many others just like it. So guys, I said it before, I'll say it again. Go to turtlesurvival.org, give what you can because it is directly helping keep animals like this on the face of the earth. Thanks so much to Nate and Chris. Thanks to the TSA for giving me unfettered uh, access here and letting me hang out with some really cute and cool baby turtles. We'll see you next time.